Many people around the world believe that this is the finest revolver ever made, the Colt Python and 357 <laughs> Magnum. So this must have just washed so, up on shore because this is the, obviously the most engineered pistol that we've seen. Now wait a minute, this looks suspiciously like an AK variant. You notice a huge difference here though? You can't remove the dust cover. Could you make a rocket launcher? Oh totally, yeah. Got a little, the pressure meter. Are we underwater? Yeah, spear gun for underwater. We're, we're currently underwater. That's cool too because like you can see the light is bending so it doesn't look straight. Love the detail. Look at the welds on this thing. Yeah, copper tubing. You got welds. You can see the pressure gauge on the, uh, and then the, the, the straps wiring, up front uh, attaching it. So we got a compound bow here. You got the cams on it and everything, and you can totally make these. You know, you can make some pretty effective recurve bows with PVC pipe. There's a bunch of tutorials on YouTube huh. on how to just buy different grade PVC pipe and all you need is a heat gun or a high powered hair dryer and they'll show you how to make super effective durable bows. Obviously tell it's been made from parts put together and welded mm -hmm. together. I love the kind of uh, ad hoc aspect of all the weapons here, it's cool. I like how the, the wood is rough, you know, you can see some rust on like the, on the bolts and everything. You can tell that this was like hammered together. It's got a very rudimentary sight. One interesting thing is it going through that hole right there. If you're using a compound or a recurve, you're either going to have feather yeah. or like synthetic fletchings, like plastic or something. And so with, with a compound bow, you generally, from my understanding, have, uh, you don't have feather fletchings. I could be mistaken, but either way, going through that little hole is going to mess up your fletchings. So usually it's on the side and you can have something like a whisker biscuit or something like that, that it goes through. But I would be concerned about that metal hole that the arrow is flying through is going to mess up my fletchings. It's almost a, yeah, this compound bow is almost a little over-engineered. I wouldn't think that you would need something like that. Just a knock, some place to knock it on the side of the bow that lines up. I like the little arrow on the inside of the metal that says it did the little direction pointing. <laughs> it's like arrow toward that guy. A lot of sights kind of look similar to that. What's cool is when you get more advanced into these compound bows, you'll have multiple sights for different ranges that you're shooting at. And it's just this little needle with a little bead on the end sticking out. Realistic, Paul, would you go for making a compound bow if you're out in the post-apocalyptic wilds or would you just try to make a regular bow? If I could, here's the thing. You got to get the cams down and everything, those those pulleys. And a cam means it's, it's got lobes. It's bigger on one side than the other. And the advantage of a compound bow is once you get it pulled back, back it's not that hard to keep it pulled back getting it there is an issue where when you have a recurve or probably the most difficult is a long bow the pressure just builds and builds and builds and you got to be really strong so if i had the capabilities for sure because getting much more energy and range with a compound bow for the amount of energy you have to put into it otherwise a recurve is really simple to make as i mentioned there's a bunch of tutorial youtube videos on how to make reliable, deadly recurve bows out of PVC pipe. Now, now it's going to be easier actually to build a crossbow than it is to build a compound bow, for sure. Really? A lot of crossbows, like the crossbow I use is actually a compound crossbow. So you can use that technology in there, but just a rudimentary crossbow are not that difficult. Remember, they've been around for thousands of years. Oh, funny story, we got a lot of toys from garage sales growing up and it was great and we didn't care, it was awesome. And so my mom, unbeknownst to me at the time, because this is, you know, the 80s, I got a Wookiee Bowcaster, but it didn't have a bow in it, but it was this plastic. And like when you pulled the trigger, these, these two hooks would come down. And so I saved some money. I went to KB Toys in the mall and I got one of those stupid bows with uh, the suction cups at the end. It was just Cowboys and Indians bow. And I modified the handle and I put it into that Wookiee bow caster because there was a notch up front for the bow to go. And I'd pull it back and then I would sharpen Tinker Toys. And I ended up launching Tinker Toys through the drywall in my room when I was like six, seven years old with this Wookiee bowcaster. So, Paul, what this basically tells me <laughs> is that you are somebody that I would want to be stuck on a deserted island with in the game of Rust trying to survive because you can obviously Probably. improvise your own weapon. <laughs> Probably. That, that's not, that wasn't the only craziness I made as a kid. It looks like he's able to pull back the line with one hand. So how much power do you think he's probably gonna get out of this cross? Not a lot. That's gonna be very short range. Like you could you could make a bow that does this, um, but that's like taking small game. You know, you're just, you're stationary, you're waiting for small game. That's not really gonna be like, you're gonna get hit by that and be like, ow! 
and then you're gonna pick up a rock and kill that dude. <laughs> you know, if you could just pull it back with one hand that easy, um, it makes a recurve a recurve is it's curved a certain way, and then when it comes in, it just adds more force when it's when it's pushing through. So that could just be like a straight, normal bow. You know, this looks super, super simple. Realistic, you could easily make it, but if he's just pulling it back with one hand, and then the other thing to consider too is there's no fletchings on that bolt. So if there's no fletchings, it's not gonna be very stable. So if this is just a short range thing, like you're just getting rabbits and squirrels and stuff after just sitting still for a long time, sure, totally believable, you could make those, but this is not something that I'd go after anything large with or at any, any distance. What? Okay. <laughs> nice. I love yes. it. You can see all the basic parts. You can see we have grip, we have a trigger, we have, it looks like an air canister strapped to the back. There's like a chamber with the magazine of the nails out the front. You've got a little bit of a sight around the front. I like how the, the, the cylinder just kind of screws in, kind of like my soda stream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this thing looks dope, man. The magazine's really interesting. The thing is with the nail gun is it's not super effective. There's a reason, like, you know, the, the 5.7, we've talked about the 5.7 round. One of the disadvantages is it's yeah, such yeah. a high speed round, it just goes right through people. And so like, you're just poking holes in people. And if you poke, unless you poke a hole through my heart or my brain, and even the brain, unless you sever the brain stem, like you can keep fighting. You know what I mean? And you can live, you can be fine. So one of the issues with the nail gun is like, that's kind of a last ditch weapon or like a harassment sort of thing. It's not gonna be super lethal. Somebody's chasing me and I had the choice to shoot him with the nail gun or shoot him like a mean stare. I'm gonna shoot him with a nail gun, obviously. So we're getting some pretty good range with those nails. Do you think we would get that kind of range in real life with an improvised nail gun? It, it depends. So there's different types of nail guns. There's like gas powered ones. Well, it's, I mean, even if it's air powered, it's gas powered but some of them you know are, are hands-free some of them use like a spring method a lot of them use compressed air and those seem to be really effective but you generally have a hose going to like an air compressor or something now those i know you can get some distance but by distance i mean you're rough in a house and then you see you're on the top floor and you see a house across the street with a pool and you're like how many nails can i get in this ching 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 so yeah they can go pretty far as far as a bullet no way and because they're lightweight um, nails, they lose a lot of energy as they're moving like really quickly. That's why I keep saying how like, you know, the 5.56 five, or 223 round that shoots out of an AR-15 is the best for home defense because it's such a lighter weight round. It doesn't penetrate drywall as much as like a full pistol caliber bullet or, or a larger bullet or a shotgun shell or well, shell. You know what I'm saying, shotgun rounds. But uh, so yeah, you could get some range on this thing, but. The further out the go you go, the less inertia and energy it has, so the less effective it's gonna be as a weapon. Izzy, have you come across anything like this? <laughs> no, man, it's, it's, I'm always, ever since we started doing Lethal Antiquities over on Shift Fire, you see the older weapons all the way up to the newer weapons. So there's like basic parts to a firearm, right? You know, you have to have something to carry, you know, like a, some sort of barrel, however you're gonna hold it, some way to ignite, you know, the projectile and get it going. Uh, so this one looks like you just have a shotgun shell inside a wooden tube that's attached to a wooden handle. There's not even a trigger. You just hit it at the top, which I'm not even sure how that would work. You'd have to get something to hit the striker inside. And it's all made out of wood, so I'm guessing it's not going to be very reliable after a couple shots, you know? So, yeah, this is like hardcore, like, match lock. Okay, so... When they call a match lock, a match lock, or a flint lock pistol, the lock is the mechanism that like, you put a piece of flint, you nape the flint, and when the flint strikes, it creates spark, and the spark goes into this little flash pan, and then like the fire goes down this little tube, and then it ignites the powder charge that you have in the projectile in. So this is just that without the lock. You're just taking a piece of flint, and you're like, ah, ah, <laughs> So yeah, this would work. This would totally work. You see that hammer thing moving back and forth? Man, I wish they could shoot it from the side like that. So the rifles I bought my, my young nieces, uh, there's these crickets, they're these single shot 22s, right? And I, I don't actually like it. I wish I would have bought them the Savage version. Because the, the way the cricket works is you you do the, your bolt, but then you pull this little like spring back. And that's kind of what that reminds me of, but he's not doing it every time. So it's interesting. I wonder why the spring is back there like that. Now. It does well, look yeah. rudimentary. It does look like it was like really engineered well, you know what I mean? And like that's a right. chonky, chonky cylinder. Right. A Russian uh, revolver, and the, the name is like just on the tip of my tongue, 
but it, there's no cylinder gap. The way it's designed, you can shoot it suppressed. But most revolvers, while you can suppress it, you're still getting gas coming out of the, the cylinder gap. I got a revolver in the other room. I could, you guys have seen it. But I mean, this thing looks super cool. Oh, so this is a legit Python. Many people around the world believe that this is the finest revolver ever made, the Colt Python in 357 <laughs> Magnum. So this must have just washed so, up on shore because this is the, obviously the most engineered pistol that we've seen. So a Colt Python is badass. I think that's also what Rick Grimes, what Rick carries on The Walking Dead. So a lot of a lot of cops carried a, a Colt Python for a while. I mean, a 357 round was developed for law enforcement fighting gangsters in the, in the 30s in bootleggers because their 38 revolver uh, rounds couldn't penetrate the heavy car doors at the time. And the gangsters had like machine guns and Browning BARs and stuff. So, but yeah, no, that's, that's sweet to see in this game, kind of surprising. You know, what's, what's funny is I always use the term suppressor just because I think it's more diplomatic, but it actually, you can call it a silencer. The guy that developed the silencer called it a silencer. Even most firearms, it doesn't really silence it. It just, you know, kind of lowers it a little bit. 45 ACP is like the perfect uh, pistol round to suppress because Half of uh, what's coming out is uh, just gases, hot gases coming out really fast, and that's what makes the initial noise. But then most bullets are supersonic. So that crack you hear is the bullet breaking the sound barrier. Well, 45 ACP and also 300 Blackout was partially developed for this as well. They have subsonic and supersonic rounds. But 45 ACP is just so slow and big and fat and ugly. It doesn't break the sound barrier, so it's a great weapon to, uh, it's a great caliber to suppress with a, with a pistol. Well, take a look at this thing. I, I love this, man. You got this stamped <laughs> So uh, Frankenstein, stamped I love it. Slide, yeah. You can see the springs, the guide rod underneath. Like, look at that big, chonky trigger. Oh my goodness. It's cool, man. This looks like stuff that I've seen in real life, improvised weapons. Well, with 3D printing these days, you know, they can do amazing things. Yeah, I think 3D printing is the wave of the future, man. You're going to be able to, rep like, Star Wars replicators. It's going to, you know, it's going to change everything as we know it. That's why I encourage, like, instead of, like, trying to regulate firearms so much, like, right now you can make almost anything if you're determined. But pretty soon you're going to be able to push a button and just print a nuke. Like, that's the way the technology is going. Like, I don't see, otherwise it's gonna pull the atoms out of the atmosphere. And so like, why not create a society that's responsible where you don't need regulation, you know? What do you think about how the mechanisms work? And are they got all the basic parts for it? Yeah, I mean, to me, it seemed pretty realistic. It seemed to work pretty well. Um, I was believing it. I would mind having one to take it apart to see how this goes. But like, the thing I really, really like about it, other than the stamped parts and how it looks like somebody like, you know, hammered that out in their garage, the open guide rod spring down below. I thought that was just like cool. Cause usually that's encased in your receiver, but just like just showing it to the world. Ludi, he was this British libertarian dude that was like, just started making machine guns. And he made a book on how to make a submachine gun out of parts of the hardware store. And he did it. And the British government's like, don't do that. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And he did it. <laughs> and then he went to jail for it. <laughs> All right, look at this bad boy. So this is totally realistic, 100%. Now, I don't think this will hold multiple rounds. This is called the water pipe Mine. shotgun, but you can take uh, gas piping. You can make a rudimentary shotgun, and what you do is you just have you know your, your pipe right here, you put the round in, and then you have another pipe behind it, and it's yep. like, they call it like a sleeve system or a slam fire. And you just have a little nail right where the primer goes. And so you put it in there and you'll have a, a forward grip on it and a grip down here. And you just go, you squeeze them together. So I'll get in the camera here, boom, like that. And you go, boom. And that works, man. You could hunt with that or it's what you would use as a gun to get another gun, to get a better gun. You know That's I mean? right. Yeah, you only need one good shot. So, oh, look at this. Dude, I have those screwdrivers in my tool pouch. The classic yellow, are they like Stanley or something? The classic yellow and black screwdriver. Yeah, there you go. Double barrel shot, you get the screw, the screwdriver charging handle. So you prime and the, that's that's the charging handle of the prime, the, uh, the firing pin, okay. It looks like they fire one at a time, which is good, because now it's giving you, you know what I mean? Two shots uh, instead of one. Yeah, shots is always better than one. Look at those old school, <laughs> those, those sights, how far apart the rear sight aperture is. Oh my goodness. That big chalky wood grip up front. Yeah. This thing's hilarious, man. That looks fun, yeah. This looks like kind of back to the pistol. It's almost like uh, hammered out in your garage style. Yeah, yeah, like on a forge, like you got your own, like look at that, this is cool. This is my favorite thing I've seen so far. It's a short barrel too, so this is only gonna <laughs> hold like three, maybe four rounds. Look at that. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of a lever action a little bit, 
the way uh, the way that uh, the bolt assembly comes back quite a bit. It reminds me of, like a lever action shotgun or a lever action uh, rifle. That's interesting. I wonder how this works. I want this. This thing's cool. That looks cool. No, very well designed. A nice, nice patina. It's got a big old suppressor on it. You totally can suppress a shotgun, you know, and depending upon how big your suppressor is will determine how much, um, you know, noise reduction you have. Type. This is kind of like the first Iron Man suit that Robert Downey Jr. pounded out in that cave out in... There you go. The Mark One. The only thing I'll say about this pump shotgun, uh, it looks heavy. It looks like just, it looks pretty heavy, like all metal, you know what I mean? And like forged together. So I imagine, you know, it's it's gonna have some substantial weight to it, which would, you know, help with recoil. The heavier weapon is, the, the more it absorbs recoil, so. So Izzy, this is one of my favorite shotguns and one I want to add to my collection, partially just oh, because really? of movie magic partially because of the engineering and, and partially because of aesthetics. Now when I say engineering, this is a semi-automatic and pump shotgun. And the reason they wanted both is it was specifically designed for law enforcement, for French law enforcement and military, and you know, outside contracts and whatnot. Less than lethal rounds do not have the same amount of recoil as a normal buckshot or slugs. And so they're, they're not as effective to run through uh, mm -hmm. most automatic shotguns. There's a gas system in it and it has to be tuned to the round. Modern semi-automatic shotguns, they're getting much better at that where you can run multiple different rounds without having any hiccups. But when this was designed, that was a serious issue. You know, it, there's a difference if you're bird hunting and you don't get like the right thing to go or whatever. But if you're in a law enforcement life or death situation, your, your system has to work every time. And so there's a selector lever that'll switch it from to semi-auto. Ah. And so, that's why we're not seeing him charge it every time. It's very unfortunate that, um, you know, we have some really, really silly gun laws here. I mean, compared to most countries, so, you know, more, much, much better. I think other countries need to really do a Second Amendment thing since the Second Amendment is a human right. It's not a uh, legal right granted to you, you know. But uh, there's some weird laws with importing those. And um, once the laws were lifted, they had already moved on to a newer version of that shotgun, so they just stopped making them. So in the United States, they're, they're pretty expensive to get a hold of. I have, you know, there's other things on my list like night vision that I think are more important than buying a Spaz 12. But <laughs> if I found one at a good price, it's going on my wall. It's going yeah. in my office. Very recognizable so. in pop culture, too. I like the Spaz 12 because you've seen it in a lot of different movies. So, yeah, pretty cool. Hey, look at this. This is like a little grease gun. It's very, Yeah, we're very back to the kind gun. of uh, real dressed down, uh, welded together version. Like like a prototype, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. And you can build these. There are, there are books out there on how to do it. Check your local laws, folks. I don't want to get anybody into trouble. You know, obviously, you want to um, at least consider, you know, your local, uh, local authorities. But yeah, you could totally build something like this. And you can build something like this with uh, basic tools. And it looks like he's got a welder here. But you can even, yeah. like I said, that uh, that P. Ludi fellow, I'm, I'm probably butchering his name, but you know, he wrote a book on how to, you know, with basic hand tools on how to build a, a submachine gun. This looks like uh, something where you have a little bit more advanced tools because there's clearly welds on there. Love the yeah. knurling on it. But I mean, this reminds me of a, of a grease gun for sure. Or a Tech 9 too. Grease gun and a Tech 9 had like a rusty baby. <laughs> Rusty Baby's the name of my Rusty punk rock Baby. band. We are Rusty Baby. Good night. Uh, it's cool. I like the sights on it. I like the the muzzle brake or the flash hider up front. Arching handle with that big old nut on the side. I mean, it's just cool. I like this thing. What do you think, man? Oh, it looks super fun. Yeah, definitely. I'm getting like World War II vibes. You know, World War II plus the streets of Los Angeles is what I'm. Thinking. Yeah, there you go. A lot of eight, a lot of '80s movies. Submachine guns were pretty popular in the '80s. You know, but I like it, it, it and it seems it, it looks like it could exist in the real world from the parts that it was made from. Water gun. Ooh, lots of duct tape. I love it. Are we shooting acid or what are we shooting? No, at? it looks like a water gun. <laughs> No, it's legitimately a water gun. Like You're in a so, pool. You're even in a little pool. But if I remember the Super Soaker, man, this looks like a Super Soaker. The Super Soaker 50 changed the game for everybody. <laughs> Me and my sister would always host, just for our class, the end of the year uh, party. And it was a big water gun fight. And so I got super into water guns. And um, I remember 
the Super Soaker 50 came out about that time, and that was like, you know, salt rifle of uh, the speak of water guns and adding all that pressure. <laughs> it was the first time it was done, you know? And so my, yep. my aunt bought me a Super Soaker 200 when it came out. And that was like, uh, holy moly, you know? That and was in California, super of course. impressive. And so I used it for a while, but then it broke. Like something internal broke. I didn't break it. And so you're yeah. going to love this story. I, uh, we went to take it back and they t accepted it on warranty and instead there was this two gallon backpack that instead of building up air pressure to propel the system, it was one of those where like you pull the tube out and then the tube fills with water from your backpack and then you push it down and it squirts like this huge stream and so then that was great because I had two gallons of water and it shoot pretty far. And then uh, one day I decided to see if I could make it into a flamethrower and uh, we'll just say allegedly I found out I could. And uh, then I realized how dangerous that was. So that uh, it's good that you did that on your own, you know, before you burned the house down. Oh, I, man, I just love this stuff. Look at that, like, looks like they found some, like, old barn wood. You know, it's just, yeah. like, scraped it together with a rock. You got your 550 cord on there. That's not even five. That's, like, cord cord. That's, like, twine, yeah. Yeah. It almost looks like athletic tape on that front grip. Yeah, that magazine looks cool. Just the patina on there. I believe everything on this. Yeah. I love this genre. You got the, the, the straps that you use in automotive. You got some... That foregrip up there and here's something that's super impressive the detail in the patina the welds and then somebody knows what they're doing here like the sights are just very impressive yeah every every part looks like it's just found parts you know but it's believable though you know they, they use their own ingenuity to like to like make it work mm -hmm. this is dope now wait a minute this looks suspiciously like an AK variant you notice a huge difference here though you can't remove the dust cover Ah, uh, you're right. It looks like one piece. Look at that weird selector in the back. I mean, this is definitely AK inspired, but this could be real. I mean, this could be yeah. very true. I just, you know, I don't know how you're going to, there's certain malfunctions where you got to take the dust cover off. I don't know how you're going to clean the bolt assembly with this, you know, with that, without being able to get, pull the bolt out. That's really important to, to be able to clean up all that carbon, but it looks real. It looks real to me. I mean, we've seen AKs that people just like built in caves, you know what I mean? That selector lover is interesting. Wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. Wait, what the heck? Is this like a, one of those stress tests or what the what do they call the tests where they really put it through the- Um, or uh, yeah. Mac from Just Military like Arms Channel. Yeah. Yeah, this like they threw it in the water and then froze it. Uh, you know, they obviously in this post-apocalyptic world, we have refrigeration units that we can freeze AKs with. Well, if so. you watch Mike Jones or Garen Thumbs, uh, uh, his torture testing, K did not do well in mud. It redeemed itself in the ice test. It did, I believe it did really, really well in the ice test. So I was hoping to see a gun that like would shoot ice or something. Like, I, I feel like it hoodwinked us. Yeah, that's gonna be cold on your hands. What's what's going on here? I guess it's gonna keep it from overheating, but I get the might the, the ice is gonna melt eventually. <laughs> I don't I don't know the point of this thing, man. It's it's pretty silly. <laughs> I think that's it's funny. That's the first unbelievable thing I've seen because even the water gun was believable. Ha! <laughs> and the in the game of Rust, that's the first unbelievable thing. Yeah, the whole game. That's the first one. I was like, nah, I don't know, man. Simple pieces hammered together wood. You got your your front wraps. Oh, look at that. Like, look at, they spent a lot of time distressing that wood. It's all yeah. cracked and everything. And like, interesting uh, little pipe or tube they got in the front there. Yeah. I don't understand, like, all right. Well. The, all the, the sights on there are, are pretty similar. So, I mean, I wish that they maybe would have done a little bit different, but hey, I mean, it works, you know? And I don't have any complaints, you know, wrapping it with the athletic tape. Looks like you can load a couple rounds in there, like four or five. Yep, yeah, uh, internal box magazine. And this thing's gonna be heavy with all that welding and, and metal going on there. The whole receiver and like it looks like the buttstock might be metal too. Yeah, it looks like it looks like it's made out of heavy metal. Look at that, we get the lunchbox with the belt ammunition coming out. Oh that <laughs> That's awesome. I mean it's a good top feed. Pretty far forward from the mechanism, though. Do you see that where the bolt is? Right. Normally, that you you pull the bolt uh, side, and the bolt is in front of where the rounds go in. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Wonder what those four tubes are? If they're like gas tubes, they just or, look like uh, stabilization. Man, it's almost steampunkish. Yeah, yeah, very steampunk. I like how rickety it is. How when you fire the 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 top cover, it kind of moves around a little bit. That big spring assembly in there doesn't that remind you of like uh, 50 cal springs or the Mark 19 when you're taking apart the Mark 19? 
Just for those that don't know, Mark 19 is a fully automatic 40 millimeter chain or belt fed grenade launcher. I'm gonna say that one more time. So I fired a couple of those uh, rounds in, in Iraq. Flame oh, thrower. really? I love it. Just simple and effective. Just a bunch of pipes and gauges and bottles. You can even see the trigger mechanism. You can see where it impacts kind of the trigger mechanism where you get the handle there. For military flamethrowers, they have a canister with gas that will go into the canister of liquid or on top or whatever and push out the liquid mm. fuel. And that's what this looks like. And you can tell the difference between a, a, like civilians since they're not worried about getting shot and stuff, it's easier for them to have gas uh, powered and gas fueled flamethrowers. Like even a but simple but I got one over there. A simple butane torch is a uh, is a type of flamethrower. For the military purposes, you want to be able to shoot out much further and also have that like fuel stick to stuff and everything. And like, and they don't all all do that. So if just stylistically, it looks super cool. It looks yeah, the piping and stuff. It looks like you could find all this stuff in your yeah, and, and the vibrant colors. I really like the vibrant colors. But the way the flame is coming out, it looks like a liquid fueled uh, flamethrower, and those are much more effective for fighting. Oh, this looks just looks so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Like stainless steel piping, like sewage piping. Well, it looks like uh, cast iron. It reminds me of a fire hydrant is what I was trying to say. Oh, I love it. You oh, take geez. any the, those big chonky rounds, mm -hmm. take the back cover off, shove that thing in there, put it back so on. So you don't have to worry about a back blast area, which is, you know, that's good to know. Most rocket launchers I've ever used, and let me know if you ever come across something different, the tube in the back is open and you got to make sure everybody, you know, you, you have a good, like, you know, 45 degree area or depending upon the rocket of clearance because you could you could kill somebody you know and this looks like that's not an issue because you just like close the thing so i'd be worried about that rocket blowing up to be honest if there's nothing you know if there's if it's not an open tube i'd be worried about that thing blowing up inside of me right no, nowhere the for tube. the pressure to go like an explosion that happens really quick like launching a grenade or a bullet right it's it's fuel and, and thrusters and you know that flame coming out there constantly yeah i'd be worried about it could you make a rocket launcher oh totally yeah my my wild arms research on youtube he's 3d printing a rocket launcher right now he's made uh he's made he made the panzer faust um, he's one of my online gun buddies um, he's currently 3d printing his own version of that arnold schwarzenegger uh, uh, commando for to rocket launcher so yeah but uh there's limitations for like the charge that you can put on it for how explosive the round is but you can use rocket fuel you can you know figure all that stuff out and you can do it legally i love this bang and they love the chalky fuse out there it's so funny it all looks like little found uh pieces for creating a grenade but obviously got some combustible elements inside there do you know what this kind of reminds me of Swiss Family Robinson, the coconut bombs. <laughs> the that? coconut bombs from Swiss Family oh, Robinson. Man. I love that movie so much. I, I know I've said this before, but like the first time I threw a hand grenade, and everybody, because I'm a pretty strong dude, and everybody's like, oh, Mike's just going to throw it really far. And I got down to the pit, and I leaned back, and I went, huh! And like the, the cadre I was with looked out, and he's like, the face, his like, look of disappointment that he quickly hid, because they don't want to like stress you out at the hand grenade range, you know? like. It was just, it was pretty, I was like, oh, I, I thought I'd go farther. And they were like, yeah, we all did too. <laughs> I, I had the same experience at the grenade range in basic training where you think you're just going to lob it. Like, I'm going to get a new record. And it's like, Boo. I think, I like think part of it feet. too is like, it's not like throwing a baseball, but you can, and some guys can, yeah. and I, you know, I can throw pretty far like a baseball now, but that first time, you know, you're not like peeling back and it's, huh, I'm trying to get centered in the camera. Huh, huh. You know, it's almost like you're shot putting, <laughs> and I think I think that kind of throws a lot of people off at first. The, the weird way yeah. to teach it. That's that's probably. Right. It looks like a hyped up version of a Molotov. For an explosion, you need fuel, heat, and pressure, right? And so you could use a can, and that's fine. But you need to put things inside of it, and you can make those things, but kills people what makes these things lethal isn't the actual explosion it's not the fuel or the heat it's the shrapnel and so if you look at old world war ii pineapple grenades they look like pineapples and all the shrapnel is on the outside but if you look at our modern hand grenades they look like baseballs and they actually found that if they make the cuts on the inside and keep the shrapnel facing inward like that it's actually more effective 
So you can use a can like that, but you just gotta make sure the pressure and the fuel and whatever you're doing for shrapnel's right. Now I will say, I'm not trying to tell people how to make their own hand grenades. Look up, legitimately look up your local laws and everything and be super careful. I wouldn't mess with that stuff at all unless I was a trained professional on that. And I'm, you know, I'm very, very libertarian. I'm telling y'all, I wouldn't mess with making your own bombs unless you really know what you're doing. You know how many people kill themselves or lose fingers just from fireworks each year? That's just another level. So not trying to poo-poo on anybody's parade, but that's that's some dangerous stuff. So just be careful, folks. So basically, we got a bunch of bean can grenades inside a bag. And then we just toss that for a bigger That bag. works. I mean, that's that's what a satchel charge is. You just drop the whole satchel and let her go. Woo! Simple. <laughs> I like how he throws it. I'm just visualizing. Ah! <laughs> 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 it's like a shot put. Yeah, like a double yeah. shot put. It looks like nice leather, man. It looks like, man, somebody spent a lot of time crafting this in order to just, like, you know, blow it up. If you want to follow my adventures, folks, check me out at Mav11B and Thunderpunk Radio on Instagram. Folks, if you want to hang out with me a little bit more, head on over to the Pop Culture Field Manual podcast wherever you listen to podcasts or on Patreon. We'll see you on the next one, team.